Thank you for joining us today in our in our discourse on political violence, history, purpose, and future. On July 13th, 2024, Thomas Matthew Crooks, a 20-year-old Pennsylvania man, attempted to assassinate the former president, Donald Trump, as Trump addressed a small open-air rally near Butler, Pennsylvania. With only a slight injury to his right ear, Trump attempted to capitalize on this newly found near-martyr status, drawing an overly donning an overly large bandage on his ear during the Republican National Convention, reminding everyone that he was nearly killed for the MAGA movement. This attack on Trump, which many thought was staged initially, brought about discussions of political violence in American history, including the assassination of President Lincoln, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, the 1981 attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan, and the 2005 attempt on George W. Bush's life in Tbilisi, Georgia. Political violence has also extended well beyond the framework of state actors in the U.S. In the 1960s, Black leaders such as Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and Fred Hampton, just to name a few, were all targeted for the threat they pose to the status quo. Before them, leaders of slave revolts, such as Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, and Nat Turner, were brutally executed, along with anyone that sympathized with their struggle for freedom. Outside of America's borders, priests, including liberation theologians, were brutally assassinated in Central America by Central American graduates of the School of the Americas, often called the School of the Assassins, including the conservative Bishop Oscar Romero in El Salvador. The Argentinian revolutionary Che Guevara was assassinated in Bolivia in 1967. Hundreds of assassination attempts were made on Fidel Castro. President Diem in, in v Vietnam was murdered in 1963. The Congolese independence leader Patrice Lumumba was assassinated in 1961. The communist Leon Trotsky was murdered in Mexico on the orders of Stalin in 1940. Prior to that, other high-profile murders for political reasons have occurred, including the assassination of Tsar Nicholas II, the Tsarina Alexandra, and their five children, including the Tsarevich Alexei. The mad monk Rasputin himself was assassinated, and countless leaders and monarchs before them, including the 1793 execution of King Louis XVI, or the King of France, which ended the monarchy. In the ancient world, four of the most high-profile political, politically motivated murders include the execution of Socrates, the execution of Spartacus and the thousands of slaves that joined his revolt, the murder of Julius Caesar by the Roman senators, and of course, the execution of Jesus of Nazareth, whose titulus read, Jesus Nazarete Rex Judei, or Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, a statement that indicates a political crime. Political violence has been with humanity since humanity began to organize itself politically. In some cases, political violence is motivated to expand political, economic, and social emancipation. In other circumstances, it is used to make sure such an expansion does not occur. Revolutions engage in political violence. Counter-revolutions engage in political violence. Rival monarchs and leaders engage in political violence for their own personal reasons. Of course, war itself is political, is politics by other means, as said by Karl von Clausewitz. Terrorism is often defined as the use of violence or the threat of violence against civilian populations for political purposes. To talk about these and other related issues, we have Dr. Rubaf J. Siebert, who is Professor Emeritus at, of Religion and Society at Western Michigan University. Dr. Siebert has written over 30 books and over 500 articles on a variety of topics, including political philosophy, political theology, critical theory of religion, the Frankfurt School in general, fascism, etc. Dr. Siebert grew up in Frankfurt, Germany, Germany during the Weimar Republic and the Third Reich. During World War II, he was drafted as a teenager into the Luftwaffe and later into the Wehrmacht. He was eventually captured by the Allied forces after the 1945 Battle of Anschaffenburg. He spent time as POW in the U.S. and eventually was sent back to Germany to help with the democratization process. After starting his family and completing his university education, he returned to the U.S., where in 1965 he accepted a position in the Comparative Religion Department at Western Michigan University, having only just recently retired after 50-plus years of teaching. 
He continues to write and lecture on a variety of topics, many of which can be found on the Rudolph J. Siebert Audiovisual Archive here on YouTube. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Siebert. You're welcome. So this is a big topic, uh, covers a lot of time, a lot of history, a lot of um, social movements, political movements, um, political economic movements, cultural movements. Um, so when we think about violence, the good question is, a good place to start is, what are the necessary components for a good definition of a political violence? Does it simply, is it simply violence for political purposes or is it something or something else essential for that definition? Well, I think one has to make a few differentiations. And the most important one is uh, probably the differentiation between um, malicious type of violence and then some positive uh, type of violence. There's violence involved in the defense of one's country, which would be positive. But then there is waterboarding, and that would be a pernicious type of a violence, which we do not find among animals. But we do find a question, of course, uh, among animals, and they are connected usually with uh, hunting or with defense or with getting a sex partner. But it is certainly, in a certain way, rational. But so there is an irrational and a rational type of uh, violence. And uh, so, of course, the struggle against this pernicious type of violence is very old in the West. So that shows how difficult it is. Already Erasmus had a group of people around him who wanted to eliminate all wars, but they were not even able to eliminate the religious wars, in spite of the fact that they had resolved the big problem of the Reformation, namely justification. The problem was, was resolved, but the religious wars went on anyway. So it is obviously a very difficult thing to handle if one could just uh, eliminate the pernicious ways of aggression and violence, then that would be a great accomplishment. So to define it is very hard, but we can say that there are different types of uh, aggression. Of course, there is aggression in the state, political violence, but then there is aggression also in the civil society. There is aggression in family. And there is, of course, the worst of all aggressions happen continually in the historical process, like we have it now in the Ukraine and in, uh, in the Middle East. So that is the, all what one could say in order to uh, get some kind of a view. And the main thing is that there is a positive and a negative type of aggression. Right. And so political violence is some form of aggression to bring about a political change in something, correct? Yeah. But so, um, it is important that it is not pernicious. So if we use waterboarding, which was invented by the Holy Inquisition and taken over by the CIA and first of all by, by the uh, Gestapo, that would be pernicious type of uh, violence in the political sphere, in the state sphere, in the historical sphere. But there is also positive ones, as for instance, here, my participation in the Battle of Aschaffenburg was in defense of uh, Germany. So that uh, such defense would be positive. Right, and, and, and also with in political violence, we have the pernicious and non-pernicious, the, the positive, the negative. Um, as you talked about, defending one's own country from aggression would be something positive, a, a positive form of, of violence or uh, violence for good ends, good means. Um, 
in defending your family from someone who's attacking, that would all be under a positive sense. Um, in the political realm, though, there's also what we have the separation of these two categories of revolutionary violence and counter-revolutionary violence. And what are the core differences between these two forms of violence? Well, uh, revolutionary violence, of course, is the future directed. It wants to create a new and better system. It moves from slavery to feudalism. It moves from feudalism to capitalism to bourgeois society. And now it moves also to socialist societies. So this type of um, violence would be rational. But then there is a counter-revolutionary violence which goes backward in history as we have it now. Um, so that would not be positive. So revolutionary violence in a sense to is emancipatory, correct? It's a sense to yeah. further right. further history to a more you know greater sense or a greater embrace of freedom, yeah. uh, self determination, and this type of a stuff. More perfect union. A more perfect union, at, right? As we as Lincoln um, articulated it, and <clears throat> I mean, we see revolutionary violence um, oftentimes in in historic in the historical process. Uh, if there are revolutions or not revolutions, uh, that's another question. Thinking about whether the American Revolution was revolutionary at all or, or simply just a separation from the bourgeoisie. But then you see things like the Russian emancipation, American emancipation from the King of England. Right. So it was not really a revolution. A revolution takes place among classes so that an older classes of domination is replaced by a new class or by no class at all, as it is the Marxist hope. Um, so that is um, the possibility to uh, overcome something bad, an old order, and to create a new one. And that would be a positive type of an aggression. But to restore an old uh, decrepit type of a of a system that would be uh, in, that would be okay. That would be a good question. Right, but attempt to do dialectics in reverse, right? To denegate that which has already right. been negated through the historical process. That would be more counter-revolutionary, or to maintain a status quo of a system that isn't revolutionary yeah. would be counter-revolutionary. Right. So Heraclitus, for instance, does not only say that there is uh, um, all things are moving, but he says what it moves. So he says war is the father of all things. So that would be a positive question. <clears throat> uh, so, but uh, so we have both. We have we have to differentiate, and of course, it is also a subjective matter. So if you are a conservative or reactionary who would say that the violence to restore the old order is something good and vice versa. So it uh, depends that one is really objective in those issues. Right, because that's oftentimes a lot of the confusion for a lot of these things is that counter-revolutionaries and counter-revolutionary movements oftentimes appear to be or present themselves as, as revolutionaries, like Hitler himself. Right. Now, that is a horrible uh, illusion which workers uh, took when Hitler <clears throat> appeared as a revolutionary to them, and many people from the socialistic camp went over to him because he th they thought he was the revolutionary. In reality, he was a counter-revolutionary. He was paid by Krupp and Thyssen, by the big capitalistic groups. And uh, so the same thing is now with Trump, there who also appears to working class people as if he was a redeemer of their lives, but in reality, he serves the ruling class. All right, and, and, and we see that in those who are backing him uh, yes, the right. first time. Yeah. And, and again, now I think Elon Musk not too recently um, said that he was pledging something like $45 million a month to the Trump campaign. 
Right. Um, I think he backed out of that, but it shows the dynamic of who would like to see him back in power. And it's generally, you know, generally um, what Marx would call the lumpen proletariats and on top of that, the very wealthy. Um, yeah. To the lumpen proletariat, to the working class people, a lot of working class people, he appears revolutionary. But of course, to those who are paying him, uh, the very wealthy, they know precisely what he's there for. Yeah. Which in general is, of course, the purpose of fascism is to restore the capitalistic system or to keep the capitalistic system. So that is going on through the whole 19th and 20th century and now has come back again. Right. And, and can, here's a good question for you. Right now, a lot of us are dealing with decolonization and decolonial studies. And we look at things like um, the British in India, and the question always comes up is, could there ever be a nonviolent revolution? I mean, Malcolm X, for instance, said there's no such thing as a nonviolent revolution. But Gandhi had the issue of satyagraha, this issue of nonviolent resistance. Can you have a nonviolent revolution? Yeah, I think uh, Gandhi showed that it can be done. So... Theoretically, it could be done, but empirically, historically, it has never happened, except maybe in the case of Gandhi. So he did not change the class system as such, but he liberated uh, India from British colonialism. So it is possible in theory, but it has happened very seldom in the historical process. Yeah, I'm sure it's really determined by historical circumstances as well. I mean, the British Empire was already in decline. The World War II, of course, had already weakened the British. Yes, right. Um, the Brits very much had a sense of honor and shame and dignity and things like this. So when they saw the the, the visuals of Indians, peaceful Indians in protest being beaten by British uh, colonial soldiers, of course, that was a shameful thing. So, but it's on the other hand, it's very difficult to shame a society or a people who have no sense of shame. Yeah. Well, they killed a lot of people in order to keep India, but <clears throat> they did not want to kill the little naked men that would have been against their own honor. And so then they uh, emancipated India, at least politically. Yeah, exactly. And and another question is, at least in terms of political violence and revolution, um, <clears throat> is it constitutional for the definition of revolution that it has to overthrow a ruling class? Or can there be uh, a revolution wherein the class structure remains the same, but something else within society, let's say the culture or the economics completely change? Or must, must the 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 class structure be overcome uh, for it to be a revolution? I think it's specific for class struggle. I mean, we are to use revolution today for almost everything, revolutionary, vacuum cleaner and whatever. So uh, I think the real specific use is in the class struggle. Right, and so that makes uh, in many ways, a lot of movements, movements for change, reform movements, not necessarily revolutionary, but reformist. Right. Uh, right. So like a lot of movements in, 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 let's say, in the United States, whether it be the civil rights movement, uh, even the black power movement, um, maybe in the uh, wildest dreams, it was to overturn the, the class structure, but really it was to reform the society that people found themselves in and not necessarily upturn the whole society. Well, our civil war was, of course, a real revolutionary war. <clears throat> there, the class, the upper, the class in the north, uh, annihilated practically the uh, slaveholder class in the south. <clears throat> that was a revolutionary. The civil war was a revolutionary war. Yeah, I think it was much more revolutionary than than what we call the revolutionary war. And if I yeah, remember right. correctly. Historically, yeah. they didn't call it 
a revolution until the Civil War. They didn't call the Revolutionary War a revolution until the Civil War. Despite the fact that the Civil War was, as you said, much more revolutionary than the revolution in and of itself. Yeah, the first one was a real war of independence. That means <clears throat> the bourgeoisie in Boston wanted to liberate itself from the bourgeoisie in London because they could not participate in the legislative process. <clears throat> so, but the Civil War, there the uh, two classes were fighting against each other and one overcame the other. Now, turning the clock back a little bit, um, I wanted to ask you about this. Was the revolutionary violence or the, the religiously inspired violence of Thomas Munzer uh, in, the, in the Peasants' Revolt, was that revolutionary, especially when you compare it to uh, Martin Luther's um, symbiotic relationship with the German aristocracy? Well, uh, they were friends there. Uh, Luther and uh, the leader of the revolution, and that was a real revolution, what Thomas Münzer did. <coughs> so, because uh, <coughs> it was the struggle of the lower class, the uh, uh, farmer class against the uh, nobility. So, that was a real class struggle, and it was the anticipation, not of the bourgeois revolutions, but of the socialistic revolutions of the 20th century and not of the 19th century bourgeois revolutions. But it was a genuine revolution, yes, because the farmers tried to liberate themselves from their feudal lords, from the lex prima noctis, the, the right that the uh, prince could sleep with the pride of every farmer in his village and all other kinds of uh, humiliating uh, fears and utter exploitation. So it sets up this um, this dynamic where the person in Western history <coughs> seems to be, you know, at the forefront of radical change in the West, and that is, of course, the bringing about of of uh, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. He himself, in many ways, sets up another social force that becomes counter-revolutionary when the revolution follows behind him in Thomas Munzer. Uh, because Thomas Munzer seemed to have a real class consciousness, whereas Luther, uh, that seemed to be missing in, in his perspective. Yes. Um, Luther was a great theologian. He was concerned with the problem of justification and with liberty, but liberty in a religious sense, not the liberation <coughs> of the bourgeoisie from the feudal lords or the um, of the farmers from the from the feudal lords. So, <coughs> yes, that is why. Right. So Münzer was a revolutionary. He was the real protagonist of the revolution has to come. And so for centuries, people were completely silent about it. And nobody was allowed to talk about Thomas Münzer. It was only then that Bloch in the 20th century um, reminded us of him again <clears throat> and uh, wrote a book about him. Yeah, it's interesting that some of the most conservative um <coughs> reactionary areas in germany today and are in thuringia where thomas munzer was um and where he led the peasants revolt uh especially today with the the, the rise of the afd or the alternative for deutschland uh party which is strongest in in thuringia and saxony in that area um, part of east germany but um, moving on, uh, in terms of, you know, comparative religion, um, you know, those of us who came out of this, um, this background here at Western Michigan University in the Department of Comparative Religion, uh, one of the, the great things about it is that we studied all these religion from a, religions from a theoretical position, and so we would do comparative analyses of, of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so the question is for us in terms of violence and political violence, how, how do we 
how is that um, not forwarded, but how are they seen within these different religions? So if we take Judaism, what does political violence look like in, in Judaism? Is it ex acceptable in the circumstances and such? Yeah. Well, sometimes people think that religion is peaceful, <clears throat> but that is not true. So when we look at the uh, um, Old Testament or the Bhagavad Gita or so, there is one war after the other. <clears throat> so particularly the Hebrew Bible is full of a question from the beginning for, to the end, from Cain and Abel on. So, <clears throat> and, uh, and that is true for the other religions too. So, um, therefore, unfortunately, religion is very much involved. There were religious wars, of course. But it is involved also in other wars with the army chaplains who participate in it and so on. Uh, of course, very often they were concerned with justified type of violence, defense, but very often defensive wars go over into aggressive wars. And so the uh, churches, the religions participated in these wars as well. In the first uh, 300 years or so, no soldier could be in the Christian community. <clears throat> and then suddenly came the alliance between the church and the state who had killed uh, its founder. And so uh, then, of course, um, the, um, that was a change in Christianity, a deep change to the, uh, toward the Constantinian type of Christianity. <clears throat> which we thought was finished after World War II, but unfortunately not. We see when we look at uh, Fox News today and the alliance with the eternal word, then we see that it happens again. Yeah, I was always amazed, even when I was a youngster studying the Hebrew Bible, studying what Christians call the Old Testament, um, to see the the dialogue or the Ten Commandments um, be presented to the people. And of course, in there is, is thou shalt not murder, sometimes translated as thou shalt not kill. And then just chapters later, it's the invasion of, of Canaan, you know, an invasion uh, of, of what is today modern day Palestine and Israel, where a mass slaughter goes on. And, and, and the God of, of the Hebrew Bible tells essentially uh, the chosen ones that that they are to massacre everybody, including the children, including the livestock, and they're chastised for not killing the livestock. And so, just again, like I said, you know, pages before, um, it's thou shalt not murder, and then it's murder on a mass scale, and then along comes Christianity, which somehow has this from from jesus of nazareth has this ban on the on the lex talionis it's a contra lex talionis against the law of retaliation and yet christianity becomes one of the most violent forces or christians let's say one of the most violent forces in in history so it seems like even these religions that have some kind of um ban or some kind of limitations on religion aren't very uh, well respected or followed uh, or 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 enacted. What do you think? Yes, I mean, all those, there were two farmers in Germany <clears throat> who did not want to participate in the war. They were both executed. But not only that, the priest who went to the execution told them that they were wrong and that the state was right. So these are extreme uh, deviations of religion like we have the army chaplain who blessed the two atomic bombs. Um, these are horrible uh, deviations from genuine religion. <clears throat> but unfortunately, yes, we must say that the religions were certainly not able to stop religions or to diminish religion. There was the uh, um, just war theory by Augustine <clears throat> but uh, we have only two monarchs in 1500 years who uh, obeyed this. Uh, otherwise, everybody else thought they had just wars and, and, uh, and no matter how unjust they may have been. 
So this is a very sad type of a chapter and that for instance, Yahweh himself uh, orders genocide and so on is an extreme uh, uh, deviation. So when people in the, interpret who, what Yahweh wanted, there is this deep antagonism between reality and the idea of God. And so more of human reality got into this than God's influence on them. So, uh, <clears throat> so these are horrible type of developments. We can say, of course, in so far as religion blesses justified violence of self-defense and so, that would still be acceptable. But very often also other forms of violence, a sick form of violence was also blessed. Yeah, and in the, in the, at least in the Islamic tradition, you have the jihad al-kabir and the jihad al-sahir, which is the the big jihad and the little jihad. And the, and the little jihad or the little struggle or effort is is the, the struggle or effort done in, in armed conflict. Uh, and it has to be justified. It has to be, um, you know, there's conditions put on it uh, through Sharia law. You know that it has to be in defense and it has to be maybe at the the call of the oppressed or the violation of a contract but there's a lot of stipulations that why war could be justified um you can never attack innocent civilians you can't attack clerics you can't poison people's food supply and their water uh, all of that existed in the islamic tradition before it ended up in many cases in the geneva conventions Yet at the same time, we'll see throughout history that that is just completely ignored by many, not by all, but by many in Islamic history, just as it was ignored in Christian history, just as it is ignored uh, in, in, uh, in Jewish history. Now, of course, the critique of Israel is that it engages in the very things that, that Zionists engage in, the very things that Judaism forbids, right? Um, and so it seems like religions attempt to put some kind of restraint on this capacity for violence, this human capacity for violence, but it just doesn't hold very well. Yeah. Well, there's Aristotle taught the virtues, and one of these virtues was fortitude. <laughs> and fortitude did not mean to repress aggression but to differentiate between bad and, and good aggression. So it, um, the virtue of fortitude was to conform the equation to prudence and to justice. So there could be a prudent and just type of uh, equation and violence, and then also imprudent and unjust. And this, of course, a virtue is a habit so people through practicing the right things, it becomes a habit which they then do almost automatically. And obviously this virtue <clears throat> did not function like other virtues neither. And it's interesting that the father of the constitution thought that a democracy could only exist with virtuous people. So when you don't have virtuous people, then democracy is threatened and then democracy sometimes is taken over by an authoritarian type of a regime. And this is the uh, danger which we are now in Europe and here too. Again. Yeah, I know, I, I totally agree. Speaking of <clears throat> virtues and and possibly a good use of violence we we have a a very poignant example in the history of of Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh the German theologian who lived during the Third Reich who struggled with the question of whether or not uh tyrannicide was justified especially in light of the Sermon on the Mount um and tyrannicide of course being the the murder of the tyrant and that really that that question of whether that could be justified plagued him for quite some time and eventually he came to the conclusion from what i understand that as as horrible as it would be the taking of an individual's life the calculus is powerful if it saved tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or again maybe even millions of people's and their lives 
um, that calculus is so overwhelming that even though it's a horrible thing to take someone's life, it might be justified. And that would be the killing of, of Hitler. So what do you think? Do you think tyrannicide is acceptable or possibly acceptable? Do you agree with Bonhoeffer on that? Well, Bonhoeffer had great problems with this, but he was part of the movement. So <clears throat> whatever his theoretical ideas were, um, he did participate and he was sentenced to death for it too. So um, the, um, it may be necessary sometimes, but every form of killing, um, but one could subsume it under <clears throat> rational type of uh, a question like in a defensive war, a country, so to speak, defends itself against its own tyrant. And in this case, it could be justified and Bonhoeffer probably did it out of those reasons. Yeah, it's, I think maybe in the older I've, I've gotten, <laughs> I've become less and less um, acceptable or finding it acceptable to do mass slaughter in the name of of some kind of um, righteous cause. You know, for instance, I, I, I've been in my studies on Russian history. I've been teaching Russian history for a while now and um, in studying the last czars, Nicholas II and uh, the Tsarina Alexandrovna, um, or Alexandra of Hess and the the children, the four grand duchesses and the Tsarevich uh, Alexei, and to to think, even though they were the inheritors inheritors of a three hundred year old aristocratic family with immense power, um, I mean the last absolute monarch in Europe was was the Tsar. Uh, at the same time, they were they were reduced to standing in a room, or in the case of the Tsarina, sitting in a chair, but in this room, and just being mass slaughtered, just shot to pieces, all of them, without any type of, of remorse. And regardless if we think that the overthrow of the monarch, as they did in France, for instance, was historical uh, or historic necessity, it just seems so absolutely brutal um, on any kind of ethical grounds, whether that be, you know, uh, a religious ethics or a secular ethics, but it seems like that type of society, that type of way of being in the world, when that becomes normative, we can justify any type of mass slaughter on for any reason. Yeah. Of course, that happened to Louis XVI too in the bourgeois revolution and his whole family. And it happened to the Tsar and the reason was it was in the context of the revolution. That means uh, the white Russian armies uh, approached close to where the Tsar was uh, situated um, in the Caucasus. Uh, no, not the Caucasus, but uh, on the border of Siberia. Yeah, Katharinburg. So, yeah. yeah, so that uh, they came, the white uh, forces came close and the was the danger that they would liberate the Tsar and would bring him back to Moscow. And so the revolution was threatened, but it was nevertheless a horrible event, yes. Yeah, and in, in that type of mass slaughter, I think we've seen, of course, in, you know, in the 20th century, throughout the 20th century into the 21st century, for instance, we see uh, political violence perpetrated by what are called lone wolf shooters, such as Anders Bering Breivik in, in Oslo and Utøya Island in Norway in, in uh, 2011, where he massacred uh, these teenagers, I think some of them were in their early 20s, who are the sons and daughters of the, the Labour Party, essentially. We saw the same type of mass slaughter with Dylan Roof in South Carolina at the Mother Emanuel Church, where he, you know, he was a white supremacist. He goes to a, a black church for Bible study. They welcome him in very lovingly. And at the end of Bible study, um, they go to say a prayer, and he takes out his gun, and he shoots everyone dead um, 
just a horrible mass slaughter. And Brent and Toronto and Christchurch, uh, New Zealand, New Zealand in the, the massacre of Muslims in the mosque. The, these shooters are generally anti-immigrant, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, anti-Latino, anti-feminist, for instance. Um, yet while they do a lot of harm, the social social changes that they seek to initiate never seem to come to fruition. So it's mass murder for a lost cause in many ways. How does one justify mass murder for a lost cause? Well, of course, it cannot cannot be justified. So uh, <clears throat> one has to see here psychoanalysis can help to see where this is rooted in man. So obviously we share with animals this equation, but we do not share with them this malicious type of an equation. That is new as far as the human species is concerned. <clears throat> so if one could still teach the virtue of fortitude, then one would say that the positive equation should of course be allowed in defense of anything, of any life and so on. But that the other one, the pernicious one, we have to get rid of. And how can one do that? And <clears throat> one thing is we obviously do not teach the virtues anymore. In our classes, the name virtue has almost completely forgotten or it's just an ideal symbol or whatever. So <clears throat> the question is how we can because our degree of violence here at home is higher than in any other country. So then the education may help if we would teach those virtues again, and we would be able to limit violence to just and prudent forms of violence, then that would be a great progress. But it's obvious that we have a hard time the last 500 years even to achieve that. Yeah, it's almost like with our positivistic education systems now where we're just mass memory of these facts and data about things that we lose the things like virtues and why virtues are important, you know, translating ideals into habits and, yeah. and understanding, you know, the universals and not just the particulars. And yeah, that all seems to get lost. I mean, I, I obviously I'm a professor of philosophy and it's I'm always amazed by my first year students who have never experienced this type of thinking because, like as you said, it's been lost in our education system. Um, civics and virtues and 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 you know the philosophy behind what a republic is and what it means and and what the Germans call a Willensgemeinschaft, you know, a, a willed community as we are in the United States, what that means. It, it's 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 almost like we're just find ourselves here and we're an aggregate of people and we're all pushing forward for our individual purposes, our own self-interest, but, well, you know, the collective and our collective identity rooted in e pluribus unum seems to be, be gone, right? And I think you're right here. That's a, a deep problem that we have in our education system. You know, and also one of the things talking about psychoanalysis, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman uh, wrote a, a fascinating book called On Killing, The Psychological psychological Cost of Learning to Kill in War and Society, where he talks about the, the natural inclination for humans not to kill, not to murder. For instance, he cites studies that were done in World War II about American GIs who would, especially fighting in Europe among Germans, that they would oftentimes shoot to miss German soldiers because they could identify with them. Henry looked like Heinrich. You know, and they could they 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 were the same kind of people, um, and they didn't want to kill. And what the U.S. military discovered was that it had a lot to do with our training, because we trained on bullseyes, and bullseyes don't look like humans, and so you don't condition the mind to respond to shooting Germans by shooting bullseyes, and and so that had to be trained changed in the training, and now. Post World War II in the U.S. military, they they shoot silhouettes. They look like humans. So when you encounter the enemy on the battlefield, you don't encounter a human being. You encounter a target, 
Um, it's just a target that looks like a human. And so that part of the brain that stops the killing has been overcome through condition. So you have a condition response, condition response. Um, but how much of that now, that type of that type of training has become normative, and at least in American society, through video games, through entertainment, through our necrophilic uh, entertainment industry, where we we're fascinated by killing, and and a lot of people who are on the margins of society, who are alienated from the society, almost have the secret wish to enact that violence on society. They would love for everything to fall apart because then they would finally have the opportunity to live in the law of the jungle and to impose their will on others through violence. So I think you're right with, with the psychoanalytic aspect. It, it would be a great insight into why violence has become prevalent, especially in the United States. Yeah. Well, it was, of course, Freud who discovered the death instinct. And he didn't like it, but he always said what he saw. So. But his followers, nobody likes this idea that there is a death instinct, but Freud insisted that there was something like that. He observed it in the hospital and so on. So um, obviously there is something like that in us, and we have to ask how that can be, particularly in our culture. Why do we have more of these of this violence inside of the country than others? So we have to change somewhat in our culture that we don't praise uh, violence, particularly not pernicious violence. Um, so waterboarding is pernicious violence, but to defend the country is good violence. So to differentiate between the two and um, teach the virtue which makes this differentiation and uh, fortifies people against these temptation or whatever they feel in themselves. And of course, what has happened in modern warfare is that the uh, combatants are more and more distant from each other. The bomber who bombs people out of uh, 30,000 feet and so on has no idea what he kills down there. He does not see the women and the children and the old people in the basements and uh, what, what he uh, what uses there. Even with the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, they saw the first time the annihilation which they produced, but then they repeated again a few days later. So, uh, <clears throat> and that was an unbelievably great tragedy which has introduced a no completely new age of warfare. And uh, we, every day we are close. The atomic watch in Washington, in New York shows us only a few seconds away from, from an atomic uh, conflagration. So, um, so we have to change our, yes, our education. It's at least one thing which should be done. <clears throat> and um, so that we become better in resisting those temptations and do not have joy in it particularly, and of course, the mass media play a role in all of this too. But as they play a negative role now, they could also play a positive role together with education. So this is our main problem in our civilization and in our culture, and particularly now, whenever there is an actual war going on, and we have two of them going on, the danger is unbelievable, and I think people are not aware how, how great that danger is. Somehow, they think Putin will not use the bomb, or he will not use atomic weapons, and so on. No, he will not, as long as he's winning. But what will he do when he is defeated, or feels that the uh, NATO moves into Russia, or wants to dismantle the Russian state, as they do feel? then, of course, the question uh, becomes particularly strong and powerful. So, so that is of highest actuality, and in our education system, we should put on this the main emphasis, because our existence depends on it.
Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, who wrote that book on killing, that, that's one of the points he made um, about PTSD, for instance. The closer you are to the violence, when you see it right in front of you, the more likely you are going to struggle with some kind of PTSD. Because we have on ourselves, you know, society-wise, thou shalt not kill, and this is immoral, and now all of a sudden, because the state has given you permission to do so, you're confronted with doing something that you've been told, you've been socialized to not do, to never do. Um, and then, of course, just the very trauma of not only seeing your comrades, your, your mates being killed, but also killing yourself. The, the, the fact that you have killed is also very damaging um, for people who are experiencing it um, uh, right there in front of them, as opposed to 30,000 feet, the very low levels of PTSD among bombers, for instance, but among combat soldiers, it's, it's very high. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, I mean, um, you're right. And, and the other point you, you made about how essentially we, we all put in the right situation could do some horrible things. Um, Philip Zimbardo, uh, just a few years ago, wrote a book called The Lucifer Effect. And Philip Zimbardo, of course, is famous for the Stanford Prison uh, Experiment. Um, but he basically demonstrated in this book, The Lucifer Effect, about how put any normal functioning human being who thinks that they have a solid moral compass, you put them in any kind of situation, and they're going to struggle not to become evil. Some will not, right? Some will absolutely resist it. But others will, as long as someone else is taking the responsibility, has the authority, they can do some of the most evil things, including some of the worst forms of, of violence. Um, you know, and I think that that dynamic may have been seen in the January 6, 2021 um, attack on the Capitol. Uh, what a, a lot of the people who attacked the Capitol, the insurrectionists, those who wanted to stage that coup d'etat on behalf of Trump, um, a lot of what they said is that we did what we did because the president asked us to. He told us to come here. He told us to to be involved and that we were going to go to the Capitol and we were going to do these things. So somehow Trump takes responsibility for it and thus allows us to um, to institute the kind of violence that we want to already do. But now, you know, now we have the opportunity. It's the opening up of that space to do that. Um, and so, you know, it, that that. January 6, 2021 was probably in terms of the American history, the recent American history, um, one of the most um, poignant forms of political violence that we've seen in a long time. Yeah, it was an attack on the very center of formal democracy, which is the peaceful exchange of power, everything, every four years. So, um, there we are at a very dangerous point now, and in the next weeks, the American people will have to decide which way they want to go. Yeah, I mean, those who might be watching this right now already know what happens in November of, of 2024, but we are in August as of right now in 2024, so we don't know. Um, and it's, like you said, it's very well possible that you'll have another insurrection. And of course, if you keep track of right-wing media, in many ways, they're already setting the stage for it. Right? Yeah. That if, if their guy doesn't win, it's because the Democrats stole it from them. And therefore, the only way to be patriotic is to resist that. And that resistance can take, can take the form of a violent resistance. Right. And, you know, and, and, it, yeah. and, right, it has happened, and, and they don't feel as if they're doing something wrong. They feel like they are, you know, the righteous uh, in the country are defending the country from people who are destroying it, as opposed to they're the ones that are undermining democracy in and of itself. Yeah. Well, it has happened in Italy. It has happened in Hungary. It has happened in Turkey. And so there is an overall trend overall disappointment with democracy that it doesn't work and um, and that's confusing and uh, too much work for the individual and so to become children again and to look up to a powerful father um, this temptation is very great at this moment and 
we cannot say how it will turn out a few months from now. Yeah, it, it appears in many ways that what Eric Fromm calls the magic helper is the role that Trump is playing. The, 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 what I call in my book on Trump, the dark charismatic, is this guy who has special qualities, God, almost like God-given qualities to, to right the wrongs of society and bring them back to power and restore the country as it used to be, make America great again, that palingenetic type of phrase that, that, that you know enacts or or it it, it uh, instills the wish it, it gives um it gives expression to the wish to turn the turn the hands of time backwards to a different america um and so yeah i mean i i don't suspect that they'll be successful in somehow stopping democracy but they certainly can damage it and trump certainly has damaged it uh non-violently at least you know in terms of explicit violence he's done it through linguistic violence symbolic violence psychological violence but january 6th was the real physical violence of the MAGA movement which is something i think that um, we have to be ready for to happen again yeah so it is about half of the population and Half of the population is enlightened and the other half is religious. And the religious side, the Christian nationalism, has joined Trump. Yeah, I mean, we definitely saw a lot of crosses and Christian flags and things like this during the insurrection in 2021. And it's like this this political movement from a guy who is has no religious bones in his body, couldn't care less about religion, but you know he makes that transaction with with a lot of conservative evangelical uh, Christian communities that if you support me, I will be the the hand grenade. I will do the internal violence to the state that you want, right? Um, but you have to, I mean, basically everyone knew in the beginning of his presidency that he was not a Christian. He never really professed. In fact, only just a couple months ago, he said, I'm not a Christian. Um, but that's when he told him that if you vote for me, you'll never have to vote again. I assume he means that means I will give you everything you want, that you'll never have to do it again. But a lot of people took it as if you vote for me, it's the last election. You won't have to vote ever again anymore, period, uh, because that'll be the end of democracy. So, I mean, the violence that he's he's promising is a violence against democracy, against the state, against the deep state, as they're called, um, as it's called in right wing circles. Um, but that violence, like I said, is very much um, linguistic, symbolic and things like this. But now also uh, could possibly be physical violence, as we've seen already on January 6, 2021. And it is pernicious type of violence. It is very pernicious. Very. <clears throat> One gets the feeling that um, since it can be justified in this righteous cause of restoring America to its Christian roots and things like this, that they can justify any type of uh, brutality on those who don't accept it, don't submit to it. Yeah. And the first wave of fascism and the on the century, of course, did the same thing. The attack against Russia was called Barbarossa, which went back to the great Catholic tradition of the Middle Ages. Yeah, that's one of the very interesting things about right-wing violence is, you know, it's often done in the name of the past, um, whereas a lot of left-wing violence is done in the name of the future. Right. What justifies it is a better future. And for the conservatives or right wingers, it's oftentimes what justifies the violence is is the past, uh, past wrongs that happened or the restoration of the past, um, the turning the clock around on the dialectical nature of history. Right. That, that, that which has already been negated has to be denegated and brought back. So the empire paradigm has to be brought back for Hitler, for instance. Um, or the uh, the Jewish state has to be brought back, you know, for for Zionists. Um, 
and as we see, as we've talked about many times, those type of projects never go well because they're anachronistic. You know, and trying to interject a different part of history into the present, and and that it, it always ends in disaster in some way. History cannot be repeated. Exactly, and Heraclitus told us that a long time ago. Right. Well, Dr. Siebert, this has been a wonderful discourse on uh, issues of political violence. And I hope those of you who are watching this uh, have enjoyed it, have learned something from it. Um, please check out some of our other videos. We have lots of videos on a lot of different issues, including just war theory that we just did a few uh, months ago. Uh, so check out the Rudolph J. Siebert audio visual archive on YouTube. And uh, if you're interested in our work, we'll have links in this video to uh, Dr. Siebert's website, my website, um, and website for uh, our sponsors. So thank you very much, Dr. Siebert, for doing this discussion today. You're welcome. All right. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.